Welcome to our next F7 session, financial reporting for the ACCA. My name is Francis Bergenzer, of course, and uh, I wish everyone a most warm welcome. Now, what should we do today? Let's look at the program, shall we? That's the best place. The, you were very kind yesterday to allow me, after we uh, answered a few questions on the mentoring session, uh, I remember a few people um, asking about things uh, with regard to what we had just done and obviously a bit of homework, etc. So apart from those questions that people asked and I answered, we had a few minutes to spare. So I decided to invest that in the next topic, uh, mainly for homework, but to do it in class. Now, the main problem, of course, the syllabus has ex expanded quite considerably for the September exam. And um, clearly, the, uh, we need to find time. So thank you for allowing me to use a few of those uh, mentoring minutes. Anyway, here's the program. In days gone by, we have done Pool, Premier, Jenny, all these questions, play script. And I, I hope you've done some of the homework as well. Then we did Pull and Shut and Purcell and some disposals and there were some for homework and then when I saw you yesterday we finished off we did Purcell, Interceptor, Telenorth and um, we also did T and I explained what impairment was all about it's emphasized in the new syllabus so please be careful what I need to do today is to move on to things like leasing so, but don't forget, if I can just go back for one second, the non-current assets, tangibles, also the intangibles, these are coming up regularly in MCQs. So please say study for MCQ possibilities. As you know, we're going to get three scenarios with um, our in our section B. Section A is, of course, 15 two-mark questions, which comes to 30 marks. Uh, section B is going to have three scenarios, 10 marks each. Each of those 10 marks are divided out into five two-mark questions on each scenario. Now, one of those scenarios, I was looking at it earlier today, was on impairment. So naturally, I have to take that impairment question extremely seriously, which is why I did T on page 144, but I invite you to do a little bit of the homework, especially this question called Steam Days, that's a nice one. I've marked it as very important. Also throughout the new specimen paper, we've got lots and lots of tangibles and intangibles running around the um, paper or seen everywhere in the paper. And a student who hasn't studied those two chapters, indeed those three chapters, will be at a disadvantage if the real exam is anything like the specimen paper. So I'll leave you to look that up. Any problems do shout, especially by email. Uh, I've given you, I believe, my email address somewhere. Let me see if I can find it for you once more. There it is. So please um, ask any questions. All right, let's march on to today's areas of interest. In particular, we need to cover leasing. That's the big one as we start that comes up regularly. You can't make it up on the day of the, of the exam. You've got to have studied it beforehand. And the other thing is this new five-step approach with inventory and revenue from contracts. I need to take you through some of that. I'll explain the concept as well as do a question. And then as time goes on, we're going to pick up the mallet question, which is based on the statement of changes in equity. Don't worry about the abbreviation. I'll explain it in due course. And chamber, of course, is all about tax. And see how the time goes. We'll get as much of that done as possible. And then maybe this, the um, foreign currency, I might move to down here. But if we can do it today, of course, that'd be great. All right, so plenty there for you to do. You will notice that between today 
and the next time I see you, we have about, you have about 20 days. Um, the directors are giving you a bit of a midterm break so you can catch up on all this homework. Okay, so don't leave it till the end. The exams are four times a year, as you know, and the exam will suddenly be upon us in just a few days, 50-something days' time, I believe. 59, something like that. So it's, d days are running out. All right, without further delay, I'm going to jump into one of my favorite topics called leasing. Um, I must say, in my day as a student, many years ago, we used to have to do these old-fashioned T accounts, yes, ledger accounts. Uh, debit this and credit that, and all, this looked really complicated. But nowadays, our examiner has moved away from all of that, and on topics like leasing, it's much more straightforward. And so that's been coming up. Leasing has been coming up in big published accounts questions. Let's say this time for 20 marks. Part of it will be a leasing complication. And of course, when you have a scenario, uh, it's so easy to see the examiner saying, here's a financial lease or whatever it might be. Here's the scenario. And can you please calculate what goes to the PL, what goes to the SFP, what goes to current liabilities, non-current liabilities, what's the depreciation, that kind of thing. So that could easily fill up um, a little scenario or certainly quite a few questions. And that's the path I'm taking, a big question as well as a small question. And so let's move on to this wonderful topic, leasing, IS-17. It's on page 147. Uh, as I say, please study Tangibles, Chapter 5, Intangibles, Chapter 6, and of course, Impairment, Chapter 7, uh, especially 5 and 6, where we, ha we are getting quite a few of these little MCQ-type questions as well as published accounts. So there we are. So leasing. What's in leasing? Exam question, exam point, etc see how we go. As always, I start up these big chapters with a feel, giving you a feel for what the exam expects of you. Okay, and so once we see that, when we read it for homework, we are then able to appreciate what leasing is all about. So what is leasing? There's a crucial exam point that I want to start with, and that is this. The um, Let's say you need an asset, yes, a motor car for your business, either for uh, the business itself to, to use, uh, maybe a motor van for delivery of goods, etc. Or you might need a motor car for one of your directors. But for whatever reason, you, the company, need a motor car. Let's assume you cannot afford to buy it outright. So what is the alternative to buying it out, outright? One option, obviously, is to rent it, and that's called an operating lease. Another way of doing it is to enter into some kind of a financial deal, a financial lease deal, a bit like hire purchase, with someone called a lessor, who is traditionally a bank, and the bank gives you effectively a loan, which you then repay over the next few years. Okay, and that's the concept of what's known as a financial lease. Now, a student who passed gave me this little motor car, which is actually a computer mouse. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little, I'm too afraid to use it as a computer mouse. It looks so beautiful. It's a sports car, a great British sports car. Um, and um, there we are. It's a little model of a car, and I want to use it as a, a teaching visual aid. So you need a car such as this for your company, okay? Your company needs a car like this. You're acting for the company. So let's say the car costs, I don't know, $20,000, and because you can't afford to buy it outright, you do a deal with the bank, this is what's called a financial lease, whereby you ask me for a loan, we do a deal, I give you a check for 20,000, 
You hand it over to the supplier, the check, you collect the motor car and drive off with it. But obviously you still owe me the 20,000. Because you can't afford to pay me back immediately, remember you're the user of the car, I'm the bank. Let's say the HSBC bank or some big bank. So I've given you a check for 20,000. Because you can't afford to pay me back immediately, but you want to pay me over the next four years, you've got to pay me say 6,000 a year. So six times four is 24,000. That's what's known as the lease price. And if you compare the lease price to the cash price, what you could have bought it for cash for, say 20,000, that difference of 4,000 is basically interest. Then it becomes a question of how you spread the interest and how I spread the interest to my p &L. Okay, so that's basically the, the flavor of this topic. Very easy indeed. And it has tremendous scope for coming up as a little complication in a big 20 mark published accounts question. And of course, it's come up repeatedly as MCQs. If you know how to do it, it's lovely. If you don't know how to do it, it's absolute torture in the exam. You can't make it up on the day, as I was saying. So let's imagine that we um, need, you need this motor car. You're the lessee and the lessor. And that's the image I want you to hold on to. Back we go to our class notes, and I'd like you to fill up the page there, 149, with about six boxes. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that. I want you to do a nice big box to start with, and then we'll subdivide it into smaller boxes. And then I'll show you the thought process that goes into deciding how to deal with leasing in the exam. That is the idea. So you get a bit of confidence. Okay, I'll cut that in half. And I'll cut these into three parts. One, two, and three. So we have six little boxes there. And so you enter the exam, let's say it's a big question on uh, published accounts, and there's a big paragraph there, which is going to carry four or five marks. How do you cope with this leasing paragraph? So the examiner will say to you, you're either dealing with a financial lease, or what's known as an operating lease. Is it a financial or an operating lease? As I was saying, the operating lease is where you're renting the car. Financial, of course, is where you're entering into some kind of a deal with a bank, whereby eventually you get possession of the car. Which one is it? You've got to decide. Operating lease is extremely straightforward because the amount that you pay to me, if let's say I'm a car hire company and you want to hire this car from me, the car hire company is the lessor, the user is the lessee. So if you want to hire a car from me, uh, that'll be an operating lease. And the amount that you charge to the P&L every year, that's it. That's your operating lease rental. And your charge is my income. So the moment you pay to me in my um, car hire company's books, p &L, that'll turn up as income. So very, very simple idea. Now, once you've decided in the exam that the examiner wants you to use a, to do a financial lease, the next question to ask is, is he asking me to deal with the lessee's books the user of the asset, or is he asking me to deal with the lessor's books? So let's say in the exam, you're likely to get that. And I would say you'd get this one, the lessees. You're not going to get the bank's books where you have a financial lease. So out of these two, lessee or lessor, most likely you'll get a lessee's. Um, calculations. 
And then the payments that you now pay to me, those installments I was telling you about, are they in arrears or in advance of every year? In arrears means at the end of the year, in advance means at the start of the year. Now, I'm afraid both of them are possible in the exam. So, I wish I could say that one of them is likely, more likely, but uh, in arrears, students say to me, it's slightly easier than in advance when they try to understand it. So, in the exam, you're likely to get a financial lease, and then the payments could be in arrears, or a few months later in another exam, it could be in advance. So I would suggest cover them both. All right, beyond that, there are some little bits and pieces for you to study. Don't worry about the study guide. I should have removed that. Leases are either financial or operating. Now, this kind of information, uh, this is a little bit like higher purchase. And this is a bit like renting. Okay, the, the lessee is renting the asset. This kind of information is needed for your MCQs. And we turn on to the next page, some homework reading, as you can see, which one's which, what are the risks, what are the rewards. A financial lease is basically where the risks and rewards of using the asset are transferred from the lessor to the lessee. Okay, and uh, if you, as you read that at home, you'll see all that borne out. And if I take you to the end of page 150 on the left-hand side, can you just uh, add something there? Essentially, the lessee who is the user is behaving like the owner. Okay, and so we move along smartly to picking up some questions that we need to fight with. So, uh, those pages for you to read at home. Some more homework reading. Financial versus operating leases. And then we come to the accounting treatment. Don't worry too much about the operating lease, that's self-explanatory. But the one on the left, this is important very important, the, fin the financial lease, not so much the operating lease. So the lessee capitalizes the lease as a non-current asset and has an obligation to pay future rentals. And as we saw yesterday, you've got to split it between current and non-current liabilities, as we will see. But it must be at cash price, okay? Or present value future payments, but cash price is the most likely, you must appreciate it, etc. And then the lessor shows the receivable for the capital sum. And all this is something called substance over form. Now what I mean by that is, if you think about it, let's say if I'm the bank, some big bank, and I'm the lessor, and I'm the one who's given you a check, and you've got to repay the check to me, do you agree until you repay the check to me, I'm actually the legal owner? Because I've given you a check, and therefore that asset is mine. But I've allowed you to use it in your business, provided one day you repay the amount I gave you plus interest, you see. So the fact of the matter is, even though I'm legally the owner, because I haven't been paid yet, remember I'm the bank, you are the one using the asset and you're the lessee. So in other words, the person using the asset must take the asset into its own books, must depreciate it as if it owns it, behaving like the owner, as we were saying earlier. So that's the big step you've got to make. The commercial reality is more important than the legal relationships. We came across something similar when we did our consolidations of subsidiaries. Okay, so I'd like you to read all of that, plenty of information. But most likely you'll get not so much an essay. You might get the odd written bit, uh, or shall we say the examiner might 
uh, examining using words on the principles, but most likely, of course, you get your numbers. You'll get numbers. And it is those numbers we're looking at next. So we're looking at in arrears and then an example called in advance. But let's start with in arrears. Have a quick read of that question, please. A company has, these are both past exam questions, though I've just updated them slightly, clarified the situation. So, a company has the option of buying a machine outright for a cash price of something, 14275 or leasing it on a financial lease, paying 5000 at the end of every year for four years. Like you, I'm multiplying this by this and I find myself with $20,000 and the difference between these two is obviously the total interest 5725 show how the company should account for this lease in its statement of profit and loss and statement of uh, for the first year financial position show full workings now, because it says that it's at the end of each year, we know, of course, it's in arrears. Because the examiner is not going to say it's in arrears. He might just say, well, it's paid at the end of the year. At the end of the year means it's in arrears. Okay. So if I just give you a chance to write those things down now, please. At the end means it's in arrears. Uh, 5,000 multiplied by 4 is 20,000. 20,000 compared to 14,275, the total interest is 5,725. Okay, so that's, please write that down. I should have put that on the screen a couple of seconds ago. My apologies. There it is. So the total interest or finance cost, as it's called, is 5,725. So please write that down. Otherwise, we need to keep moving, getting our little calculations done. So how to proceed with this? I'm taking into our usual area where we write all this down. Example 1, page 152. Financial lease in arrears and in lessees books. If in doubt, always do the lessees books, the use of the asset. And this is your IAS 17. Could come up either as a little MCQ or a more elaborate question as I'm doing here. But as always, if at all possible, I'll break it down into specific steps. So let's start with step one. Might take that a little bit thicker. Step one. Is what we call the price structure. Now, how do we do the price structure? We start with the lease price which is $5,000 times 4. And so let's say all these are dollars. This comes to 20000 And then you compare that to the cash price, which is given as 14275 So those are your typical uh, bits of information from a typical question. And the difference is 5725 and so that's your total interest. Step two we do something called movement of the liability. Remember, if I'm the lessor and I, you're the lessee, the liability that you owe me is that thing, 14, because that's a check I gave you, not 20. Okay, very important indeed. 
Now, to conquer this, I've developed, um, because this is in arrears, okay, this is in arrears, I've developed a six-column approach. So I'll just write that here, six columns, just between you and me. So we write left to right the year, the opening balance, doing a little table, plus the interest, which is said to be 15%. By the way, you'll never be asked to work it out. So don't even attempt it. You'll never be asked to work out the 15%. It'll be given. And so as you add left to right, this is what's known as outstanding or a subtotal. So how many columns is that? One, two, three, four. Minus the installment and therefore the closing balance is there. Okay, so the PL is what sees this figure going, the SFP is what sees that column going, but we need to break it down a little bit between current and non current in a second. Okay, so let's leave two lines, come down to the third line, year one, and the cash price is 14. 275. So you start with the cash price. 15% of that is using a calculator 2141. So the numbers are quite detailed on leasing. 16,416. You take away from that 5,000. And so the running total is 11,416. And that's it. And that's leasing. Okay, that's leasing done for you. What goes to the PL for the first year? 2141. What goes to the SFP? 11416. But that's a total liability. What we need to do, strictly speaking, is to divide it into the current and the non and the non-current. And for that, and for that alone, we need to do one more year. So again, can I ask you to leave a blank line? And on the next line, bring forward 11,416. And so if you take 15% of that, we have 1712. This is 13,128. Take away 5,000. And that figure is... 8128 and so we leave a line and bring that forward and so it goes on so strictly speaking I can stop there the 11416 is what we call the total liability but the 8128 <coughs> is what's called the non-current liability so that is called the non current liability and obviously the difference between these two is what's known as the current liability as I'll show you now with the open mission can I just finish off these five years four years so we have a more a fuller picture 8128 plus 15 percent which is 1219 and that gives us a running total of 9347 take away 5,000 and so this figure is 4347 leave a line year 4 4347 now obviously right at the end I must have nil so to the left of that I suppose I better have a 5,000 in brackets and to the left of that naturally I must have 5,000 because then it comes out to nil and so the figure that's missing is 653, rounding it off, not 652. Okay, because obviously the grand total is 5725. And this figure here is obviously 20,000. And if I take a quick overview, if you take hold of this thing and add to it this thing, and subtract this figure from it 
the figure should eventually be nil. Just a quick mental check in class. Okay, so it's a really, really easy story there. The only thing to look out for is if the question says the cash price is 14275 but the lessee to show their good faith has paid a 2000 deposit on the day of signing the contract to the lessor naturally the 14275 comes down to 12275 and naturally that's what the interest will be based on okay be very careful with that so I'll just ask you to see also special points at the very end of the chapter on leasing. At the very end, there's some special exam points. Sometimes comes up, so I'll leave you to look that up for homework. All right, otherwise, if that's my step two, I better move into step three, which is where all this is displayed in the PNL and the SFP. So allow me to move on away from that. If I go back to this and call it, say, my first page, I can then move on to my second page. And here we have our financial lease continued. Don't forget, this is my step three in the exam. And this is what happens in PNL and SFP. And we're talking about in arrears and at end of year one. And what I'm going to do is something radical. I'm going to divide my page out into two sides, left and right. Okay. And on the left, I'm going to use the word easy. And on the right, I'm going to say less easy. I'm hoping that you'll think of both of them as easy. But most students will find the thing on the left a bit easier. So in the exam, all you're trying to do is to get to half your marks as easily as possible. So why not try the left-hand side first? Okay, so what happens in published accounts? Published accounts, as it's called. Now, we'll start with the P&L and PL on this side. The easy PL is your depreciation. So I'm going to write depreciation for the year. Let's do the easy bits first. You always start with the cash price. The cost is the cash price, which is obviously 14275 where these are dollars, yep, 14275 and you divide by the life, which is four years. And so the depreciation per year is some 3569. And sticking with what I shall describe as easy marks, I'm going to work down the page and pick up the SFP aspect of the same thing. The statement of financial position aspects. So what to bring into play here, we're going to have the cost, which is 
14 to 75. Don't forget this is the cash price. So never take the lease price, always the cash price. If a deposit is, pay, is paid of 2,000, the amount that's subjected to interest is of course 12,275, but the cash price remains at 14,275. Don't forget that. Less the accumulated depreciation to date, all the years to date, 3569 and so the grand total is 10,706 that's your net book value okay then as I move across to the right hand side the P&L the less easy the more advanced aspects of the P&L I suppose one advanced aspect of the P&L has got to be the interest the interest or finance cost and from the table of figures 2141 is the answer and that was paid by the year end and that's part of the first 5,000 installment. So if I flick back to show you where all this appears, you can see there, if you follow this technique, the interest is the third column, 2141. Very straightforward indeed. Okay. So bring the 2141 into account. And once the 5,000 is paid, you clear off the... Maybe I'll just go back and explain that point again. You see, when that 5,000 is paid, you're clearing off the 2141 interest and you're paying something like 2859 towards capital. You see, and that is why, because less capital is outstanding, less of the principal amount, the capital amount is outstanding at the start of the second year, the interest for the second year is only 1712 as opposed to last year's larger figure. So every time you pay 5000, let's say in the second year you pay 5000, that clears off the interest for that second year 1712 and the remaining figure goes towards capital. And so because there's less capital outstanding, the interest falls and so it goes on and on. Okay, so you need to practice this question maybe one more as per the homework. All right, now we move, we move on to the SFP. This is seen by students as slightly advanced. The total liability at the end of the first year is 11,416. You see, but part of that is your current liability which is obviously if I show you how that works to go back to this here because your non-current liability is this thing here Because your current liability, your non-current liability is that thing there, the difference between really 11 and 8, that becomes the current liability. That's how it works. Very, very simple method. So let's go have a look at this. Current liability, leave a couple of lines. Non-current liability, whichever you want to do first makes no difference. So the non-current liability is the figure at the end of the year after the reporting date. 
one extra year. And that figure is 8128. And so if you compare that thing to 8128, the difference is 3288. So some people like to do it in another way, that is to say 5000, which is the second installment minus interest for year two, which is 1712. So if you deduct those two, you come to the same one, three, two, eight, eight. So either method's fine, but this is the second installment. Okay, so the thing on the right is seen by students is a bit difficult, but I don't think it's too bad, is it? It's quite straightforward, really. So that's your in arrears story. Naturally, we need to move on to the next aspect, which is, of course, in advance. So still that motor car I was telling you about and here we have a picture of a motor car of that style to hold your interest. So here we are. We move down the page to in advance as dreaming as as writing this question. So what does it say? It's a past exam question. This is in advance. Be careful. So what does it say here? To reward a long-suffering, sorry, long-serving senior F7 lecturer, a college seeks to buy a specialist sports car, an Aston Martin. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a very uh, special sports car we have in the UK. It's a worldwide brand. I think James Bond uses it. Well, I know he does. Uh, so <laughs> Aston Martin as a company car, taxed as a benefit in kind. Oh, dear. Two advertisements appear in the local newspaper for second-hand Astons at 11,000. Now, if you know what an Aston Martin is, there's a zero missing somewhere. The lecturer visits the showroom nearest the company and after an AA inspection, some automobile association, some people who inspect cars, negotiates a second-hand second car's price down to 10,425. So that naturally becomes the cash price. On the understanding that the company, the college, will pay uh, 2500 immediately. Okay, so that's how I know it's in, in advance, as the contract is signed. On the 1st of January 2014, with four more installments on the anniversary of signing the agreement. The implicit rate of interest is 10% per annum. See that? So what we're saying is if you take your 2500 and multiply by effectively five installments, 12,500. The gap between those two is your total interest, which is 2,075. You see? Uh, four more installments, plus obviously the amount that was paid immediately. That makes it five installments. And effectively, the examiner says the interest rate is 10%. Never, never try to work it out. It will always be given to you. Okay. Show how the company should account for this lease in the statement of PL and SFP for the first year. And that's your typical picture of a motor car, very similar to the one I'm holding up here. All right, let's <coughs> get back to our numerical assault on this topic. How do we get this, the marks, all the marks we need? So let's, as usual, go back to where we're doing all these calculations, maybe a brand new page. And this time I've got example two, page 152 called in advance. And it is a financial lease, finance lease, and it is in the lessee's books. If in doubt, it's all the lessee's books. All right, step one, step two, step three. Step one, we do what's known as the price structure. The lease price is five times 
2,500, which is 12,500. Then we have the cash price, which is given as 10,425. And so this figure here, 2,075, and that's your total interest. This is so easy. Okay, so on the exam, just be careful. The cash price is what is depreciated, etc., not the lease price. And so we go into step two, leave a line. This is where we do our, our special table or movement of the liability. The liability, of course, is this figure here. Because, let's say, if I'm the bank, I'm the lessor, you're the lessee, you're the user, I've given you a check for 10425 which you owe me back. And over several years, over the next five years, you'll pay me 12,500, 2,500 per annum, effectively meaning that you're charging interest, and I'm charging you interest, 2,075. You're charging your P&L with interest. Moving to the liability. So let's go for the six column approach. As always, we have the year, we have the opening balance, and then it seems that the installment is paid at the start of the year. So I'm going to say minus installment. So the installment column happens a bit earlier. We then have the outstanding or subtotal plus obviously the finance cost six columns be careful and the finance cost the examiner's worked out at 10 percent remember this is in advance i'd like you to write that down somewhere and so you have your closing balance which is the balance sheet figure well, ideally we should split it between current and non-current and the finance cost, of course, goes to your P&L, or income statement. Now, once more, can I ask you please to definitely leave two blank lines, maybe even three. Maybe you should say, I should say three blank lines. Leave three blank lines and come down to about here, year one, and let's bring in the cash price. And so we take away the installment, which is said to be 2,500. The amount outstanding is said to be 7,925. You take away the installment to give 7,925, but then you add the interest, 793 at 10%. And so your closing balance is 8,718. That, unfortunately, is the total liability. We have to split it between current and non-current. Okay, be careful. Now, just one important point before we go further. This 2,500, I'd like you to write in those three lines that you have left blank there. Can I just say, ask you to write, this includes no... This has no interest, includes no interest. Yes, because obviously it's like a down payment, a deposit. Very, very important indeed. And so what happens, again, if you leave a blank line and come down to the line after the blank line, you have 8718. Take away 2,500. And this is 6218. That, by the way, because this is a bit front loaded, this is a non current liability. Whereas in the previous exercise, we did a non current liability a little bit later in that column. I'm sorry, in that row of figures. Interest on that 10%, 622. 
giving us a running total of 6840 again leaving a blank line coming down to year 3 6840 take away 2500 gives you 4340 10% thereon 434 Four seven seven four again leaving a line year four four seven seven four take away two thousand five hundred two two seven four and if I hop across leaving a line to year five I suppose somewhere at the end of year five I've got to have nil. Okay, which means once this 2,500 is paid, this should be all nil, nil, nil. And so to the left of that you must have 2,500, which I suppose I can show here, which leads me to say that the interest is 2 to 6. Say, not 2 to 7. Thereby I can add up to 2075. Okay, very, very straightforward indeed. So as you can see, because the in the first year you pay 2500 as a, as the year begins this 793 is paid as part of this second 2500 this 622 is paid as part of that this 434 is paid as part of that and of course 226 is paid as part of that okay and so the 622 because it's paid after the 6218 is established and because the 2500 is front-loaded, it's paid early in the year, the 6218 is what we call the non-current liability. Please notice where the non-current liability features when you're doing a, uh, an in-advance exercise compared to in arrears. Do be careful of that. All right, so the these two columns the installment column and the finance cost column these two columns if you're doing it in advance notice where they feature if I quickly take you back to in arrears you will notice that those two columns are swapped they're back here so it's a, like a crossover, okay? Do be careful when you're revising that at home. All right, so that's your step two. Students find the in advance slightly worse than in arrears because of the timing. So just spend a couple of extra minutes trying to understand that. I've explained everything I can, except of course the final step, which is naturally my what happens in published accounts so let's move on to that last step page two i suppose step three what happens in the published p and l and balance sheet sfp at the end of year one as we did earlier let's draw a line down the page
And on the left, as before, I'm going to say these are easy. In the exam, don't say that, of course. Because if you say it's easy and then get it wrong, it looks a bit bad. So, <laughs> so this is less easy, just between you and me. And so naturally, get the easy marks first. And those marks are basically the PNL for year one. Easy and less easy. Easy, of course, is the depreciation. So let's bring that into play. Depreciation for the year. The cash price is the cost, and that is 10425 Let's say these are all dollars. 10425 and we're going to take that and divide by the five-year life. And so the depreciation per annum, 2085 every year. Okay, always assume straight line depreciation unless told otherwise. The other thing I'm thinking about is the SFP. at the end of year one. Obviously you've got your non-current assets, your cost, which equals the cash price, which equals 10,425 less accumulated depreciation, which is 2085 and so <clears throat> the difference is 8340 and that is your net book carrying value very straightforward don't forget as accumulated depreciation be careful in case you're not in the first year but you're in the second year so, in which case the 2085 would be twice that if you're dealing with things in the second year. So, watch the dates. Of the lease as compared to the published accounts date. Okay. As you do more questions, you'll see that in my class notes. I'll explain what that means. All right, a few minutes left. Let's see if we can get the next bit of our P&L done. Obviously, the finance cost for year one is 793. This is shown as a charge. Please write this down even though not yet paid. At the end of year one, it will be paid as part of the second installment. Let me explain. I was saying to you that 793 is paid as part of the second 2500. The first 2500 doesn't have any interest in it. Okay, so it's part of the second installment. So even though it ha isn't paid until early in the new year, and at the end of the first year it is unpaid, we prepare accounts on the accruals basis, not the cash basis. That is the point. Okay, maybe I'll just write that down. We do financial reporting, our, our paper on the accruals basis, not as weaker students think, the cash basis. In other words, whether something is paid or not, if it should have been paid, that comes in as the P&L. If it relates to this here, it comes into the P&L. Okay, be careful of that. And of course, the SFP, just to conclude, the total liabilities are 
at the end of the first year is 8718. But of course, we've got to break it down into the current and the non current. The current liability, and if I leave three lines, I can bring in the non current. The non current liability, if you remember, was picked up halfway through the second row of figures, 6218. So once that 6218 comes into play, I'll say 6218. And so the figure that's missing has got to be 2500. which of course is made up of the accrued interest at the end of the previous year, which is 793. And of course, the pure capital element, which is 1707. And together that comes to, that's another way of doing it. Or if you can break it down, so much the better into these two little bullet points. So all this I explain again and again through many examples in that chapter 8. So I'll leave you to look that up. Also, don't ignore operating leases. Let's have a look at one small question there about a, a photocopier. All right, otherwise, given the size of this massive syllabus, you and I must try to uh, move on to the next bit. Okay, so I need to get past that into the next topic. So where are we with our class notes? Let's have a look. The um, study program, class work and homework, arrears, advanced, done all that. I'll leave you to pick up some of the homework there, read through the rest of the chapter. Though I have mentioned some specific bits of homework for you to do. I need to move on now to inventory and revenue from contracts with customers, bits of biological assets, that kind of thing, which of course is chapter nine. So where's my class notes, here they are. This should be December 2015. Little misprint on the next page, sorry about that. Um, you need to, with MCQs you get all kinds of obscure points. My sincere hope is when you pick up that exam Something like 98% of what's in the exam are in the class notes. You didn't have to touch any revision kit or anything like that. 98% of what comes up in the exam are in the class notes. I'll give the examiner one, two mark MCQ, some idea he has that he examines, something he's made up, that's fine. But I'm sure we can get our 50 after the remaining 98%, 98 marks. Okay, so I'm hoping that virtually the whole exam can be found in these class notes, provided you study them. The operating lease is a nice example, that's an important one. Obviously I do that on my full-time courses, if I have a bit, few more days to cover it. Um, an operating lease. Beyond that, as you move along, there are some bits and pieces that bring to life some of the methods I've been using just now in class. Do have a look, light read through all of that. As you can see, many, many pages. Then you have there uh, an example for homework in arrears. And then as you'd imagine, on the next page, homework example in advance. Okay, if you have time, otherwise just master the ones we've done. And then beyond that, Plenty there for you to keep reading and picking up some ideas from past exam questions, etc. Okay, so otherwise, as I was saying at the very end of this chapter, on page 61, there are these important points. So these are exam special points. So that's the end of the chapter. I refer to that if you remember half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago. Okay.
Inventory and revenue from contracts with customers. Let's run through this. This is your IS2. This is your IFRS 15. The IS has stopped in about the year 2000, and but many of them are still examinable. And then the IFRS has began, and so far we've got as far as revenue from contracts with customers, IFRS 15. I understand in the pipeline there's a leasing standard, uh, which will be another IFRS, which will change everything we've done uh, in the last hour. But that's not to be examined, will not be examined till it's actually issued in a little while. So uh, that's another matter. But otherwise, the latest IFRS that we have to worry about is IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Okay, what else do we have in this chapter? Inventories, construction contracts, all that kind of thing. Uh, towards the end, there's something called agriculture biological assets. This is something I want you to do for home study. The whole chapter, really, but that's a nice one, about a page or so in length. Okay, let's make a start with inventories. Inventory should be valued at the car carried at the lower of cost and net realizable value. And someone asked me about this when I was doing my mentoring session last night with you. So there you are, the famous rule. And I've explained there what is cost, what is net realized value, etc. You can easily pick that up yourself. On the next page, there's a small little question, optional homework called Daisy. But here's a recent exam question. Now this is something I would like to look at because obviously it's uh, come up in a big published question. Here's a challenge from a recent question. Despite the year end being 31st December 2014, the inventory of Highwood, past exam question, was not counted until the about four days too late. Four days after year end. So how can inventory be examined, the lower of cost and net realizable value, also things like, you know, the physical counting of stock. So here's a little paragraph out of a big published accounts question. So the year end is the 31st of March 2014. The inventory of Highwood was not counted until four days after the year end due to operational reasons. Maybe staff are away studying for the ACC exams. Who knows? At this state, the value, its value at cost was 36 million, that's four days after the year end, and this figure has been used in computing cost of sales. Okay, between the year end, four days earlier, and the 4th of April, four days later, Howard received a delivery of goods at a cost of 2.7 million and made sales of 7.8 at a markup on cost of 30%. Neither the goods delivered nor the sales made in this period of four days were included in Highwood's purchases. Okay, okay, fine. So what adjustments are needed to inventory and what figures for inventory must be included in the SFB? So here's my solution. Basically what's happening is something like this. The year end is say about here and because staff are away on study leave or whatever, the manager couldn't count stock until the staff came back four days later. And then the examiner gives you the figure for stock at this date. What the students got to do is to realize that the year end is not this, but this date. So they need to reverse what has happened during those four days. So if anything has been purchased in, you need to take it back out. And if anything has been sold out, you need to bring it back in. In other words, you're doing the, the opposite of what has actually happened. That is the key point, the key word, the word opposite. Okay, so this has come up, as I say, in published accounts as well as in MCQs. So you've got to do the opposite of what has happened to inventory. So if you receive, you've received, you've purchased something of 2,700, you need to now minus it. And if you've sold something, to reduce it to cost, you have to add it back. And so the net is a plus of 3.3. .3. If, if it's counted at 36,000, four days earlier, it must have been 39,300. Okay, the true inventory, four days early at the year end, 
for inclusion, the SFB must be 39,300. Okay, so that's an important question for you to understand. The key word, of course, is opposite. You've got to do the opposite of what has happened. All right, what else do we have? We now come to this new, new area, um, examinable for the first time about a year ago, September 2015. And since that time, it's come up for a couple of marks here and there, MCQs. So you don't need to get into the full detail of this because it's obviously examinable also at the next level up, P2, uh, Corporate Reporting, and they've claimed it as their IAS, IFRS. So for us, I think it'll be quite an easy question. I'm taking no chances. I'm showing you how the principles work and then giving you some homework uh, practice questions to do with full answers supplied by me, full details. But I just want to give you a flavor of how you might handle something like this. So IFRS 15, a new standard that deals with transactions resulting in revenue. Underline that. It replaces the old IS 18 and IS 11, etc., which was seen as not strong enough to cope with problems in practice, not robust enough. It specifies how and when a company should recognize revenue, and it gives us what's known as a five step model. I'm sorry, it's not three steps, it's written by the IAS people. The main objective is to report the nature, amount, timing, and uncertainty of revenue and cash flows arising from a contract with a customer. So that's the idea behind the standard. Okay, so it could become up as part of published accounts, of course, an MCQ, etc. So what's the issue here? Let's say you're putting up a nice big building and, um, you know, how much profit do you take each year if you're constructing the building? Quite simply, a business cannot, must not wait until a long-term contract which lasts several years is completed before any profit or loss is taken to the PL. That would be a distortion of the truth. The company performing the contract, that's you, would have been successfully completing stages of the contract and must therefore take some profit as contract activity progresses. Now, a little while ago, I was in Malaysia and I was standing by this wonderful building called the Petronas Towers. I have a model here. See that? I wonder how long it would take to put up a building like this. I believe it took about five years, if my memory is right. And about halfway up the building, these two big tall towers, there's a little observation bridge. So I want you to imagine you're constructing this massive building way into the sky, 452 meters high this building is. One of the tallest buildings in the world, certainly one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. And I just began to imagine, imagine that's what we're talking about. We're putting up a long, uh, 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 doing a contract on behalf of a client. For example, you're putting up a building. See, how do you do it? That's the idea, just to capture your imagination. So you've got to take some profit as you go along. You can't wait for the end and take everything immediately. Okay, now. The principles of recognition. Let's think of another scenario. Let's say you're, you're supplying me with this machine. You're the person supplying this machine, some very expensive machine. And uh, on top of that, you're providing also two years of free servicing. Let's say the machine costs 270. And two years of servicing, usually, would cost 30,000 each. So you're selling me the machine as well as two years of servicing, but you're not charging me 270 plus 30 plus 30, 330. You're selling it to me for 300. You see? Now, obviously, because you've done a deal and you've sold me the machine plus the servicing, from the company's point of view, how to split the value of the machine from the value of the servicing. This is the concept behind it. Okay, uh, so I'll look at a question. Before we do that, the principles of recognition. I was saying to you there are five steps. Step one, identify the contract. Okay, step two, the separate performance obligations. Step three, determine the transaction price. Four, 
allocate the price to performance obligations, what's known as unbundling, and then finally recognize revenue when uh, or as each performance obligation is satisfied. Sorry, can you write in the word satisfied? Machine ate that up. So if you look here to the top, the C could be, the, the, the contract could be C, O, P, A, R. I wish I could have made it an easier, more commonly used word, but maybe that will stick in your mind. Five steps, co pa, like that. Okay, you need to learn that. Uh, I would say this is the trickiest one, unbundling it all. The effect of this approach is that revenue is recognized when control over the goods or services promised in the contract is provided. In other words, you give me the goods and I'm your customer, but how much do you take in your P&L? That is the flavor of what we are doing. Follow the details of the company's accounting policy, etc. All right. Moving on, therefore, we have a little question for us to play with called Gale. Beyond that, there's another big construction going on of a big stadium. And there is a question there called bricks and mortar. I'll come to that in a minute. Let's have a look at Gale. So would you read that, please, yourself? And I'll show you how to handle something like this. Very, very straightforward indeed. But it's new. It's obviously always likely because it's new. Right, so you are Gale, you sell these special machines to the food industry. So you're selling, it's from your point of view. I am your customer, like that. Each can be bought alone for 270,000 or as a package with a two year service agreement included within the price of 300,000. So what you're selling me really is 330. Okay, so after the two-year period, the annual service agreements may be purchased at a standard cost of 30,000, giving you a flavor of what it's like. Okay, annual service charge. So really what you are selling is 270 plus two lots of 30. So you're selling me 270 plus 2 times 30, which is obviously 60. And so ultimately, I suppose you're selling me 330's worth of value. Halfway through the current year, underline halfway, Gale sold 40 machines with a service package in a single order to a Russian farm cooperative. So if you multiply 40 machines by 300,000, I suppose the revenue you'll get should be 12 million. Okay, now it becomes a question of how to split that. How should the related revenue be recorded in Gale's financial statements for the year? So I suppose what I could do is to take the machine, which is 270, and what are you selling? You're selling 330's worth. And so you're getting, you can attribute 82% of the sales revenue is for the machine. MC is machine. MC means machine. Okay. Now what I'd like to do, just because this is quite new stuff and I want you to relax about it, can I ask you please to move on to page 425? There I show you how something like this might be done. So on page 425, at the end of the class notes, I show you steadily how all this works. Ignore all the study guide reference. Um, okay, COPA, here's your C, O, P, A, that's the big one, that's, an, that's the awkward one. And of course, recognizing revenue. 
So how to lay this out. First thing, identify the contract with the customer. Gail has a sailor and service contract. Good, good. To deliver um, these machines. Identify the separate performance obligation. The obligation, there are two performance obligations, obviously the machines plus the servicing for two years. Because the contract started in the middle of the current year, you've got to be a little bit careful about your uh, 24 months, etc. So where are we? Allocate the transaction price to the separate performance obligations in the contract, what's known as unbundling. Now this is the awkward part. Twelve million is allocated, underline that, to the two performance obligations as if they are standalone things you're selling. Okay, so we have the obligation, we have the standalone price, and we have the allocation of revenue. So you can see there. The first thing I suppose one should do is this working out the machine value of 270. The next thing is to say, therefore, the servicing must be 60. And if I add them up, I've got 330. Okay, so 270, the machine. First lay it all out. The machine is 270. The two year servicing is 60. Therefore, in grand total terms, is 330. I suppose the next thing I should do is this famous percentage. 270 divided by 330 is 82%. And that 82%, I'd like to move across here to the percentages. So I suppose I could make this my fifth step. So these are the various steps, tiny little steps. And once you get your 82% done, you can pick this up as the sixth thing. Okay, so be careful. The 82% is to be multiplied by 12 million. That's really important. That's how I got that. If that is 82%, I suppose this 18% this must be the leftover bit. This is number eight, I suppose, whatever's left compared to 12 million. Sorry about my typing, should have been there. It looked okay on the screen, but when you print it out, it looks a little bit different. So that's your eight. This, I suppose, is the ninth thing. And this, I suppose, is the tenth thing. Lots of little, 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 little steps. And that's your total contract price. Okay. So that's how to do it. You need to look through that again. We're just splitting. The most important thing, I suppose, is the 82%. So you take your 270, Two lots of two years, 60, make it 330. Do a little fraction, that's a percentage, 82%. 82% of 12 million, key point, is step six there. And the difference, as you can see, 18% is 2160. So in the PL, you show the machine sale and the servicing separated. That's the deal. When the machines are provided to the customer, Gail should recognize the rated revenue by debiting bank crediting revenue. As the servicing is provided the customer to the customer, the related revenue is recognized. And because it was a mid-year sale, you see, you've got to take six over 24. That's crucial. And so you have debit to receivable bank, credit to revenue, and so on. Uh, if all received at once, you can set up a deferred income account and then transfer it steadily to the PL. Depends on what each question says. Okay, the examiner will give you in the question details as to how to work this out. Beyond that, you have the answer to bricks and mortar. Uh, the question for which I need to take you back and just show you where to find it. So if I take you back, please, to your page 425, I'm sorry, 167. Beyond Gale, you have that 
question there called bricks and mortar. Maybe a little bit too much for our exam, but at, at some stage in the future that's going to come up, whether it's this time or in a year's time, because it's all quite new. Usually when something is brand new, it's examined at P2 first in a big way, and gradually it comes down to F7. And for F7 currently we're just getting little MCQs, and maybe a small adjustment we've had in the um, specimen exam to one of, the, one of those uh, scenarios. I was looking at it earlier this morning, actually, preparing for today's lecture. Okay, here we're constructing a bridge, and I've gone there into various aspects that might be examined. It's in the syllabus, so every one of those one, two, three, and four, I've explained in huge detail in the answer at the back. So do, do please have a look at that for homework. Otherwise, what else is there in this chapter? I've explained each of those steps, those five steps in great detail. I'd like you just to read that through. As you're reading it through, you come across little questions like hexam. You see? A little later, there's another one so far to go. Furniture where the small question, small solution, film buff, see that? Lots and lots of explanations as to how it all works. I'd like you just to spend some time reading through those words, just in case on the off chance, little bits of it might come up. But don't take it on as a big burden. The one that I would like you to spend time on, however, another one called eShop, The one I'd like you to spend time on is Bill and Hold, because that is, um, it's new really, and uh, maybe possible for the exam. So a little question they're called Racket. All right, so I'll leave you to read up the rest of that chapter. Now, there's also a little page there on agriculture, um, not to be ignored, that's part of our, our syllabus and we've had the odd MCQ on this in recent times. So be careful, uh, biological assets or agriculture is also in our syllabus. So basically this is an IS, IS 41. Uh, biological assets are to be measured at fair value, less cost to sell. We covered this under impairment yesterday during our mentoring session and of course homework reading. Uh, <laughs> hi Emmanuel and uh, biological assets you need to read that living animals and plants and uh, it's all that is you know because it's an IS and let's say you're an ACCA student and your client has got cattle and crops and so on sheep and cows and so on you have to be able to handle it you can't say well I don't know how to value these things I can only value buildings and machinery. But uh, there are certain rules that you need to go through. So all you have to do is to read one page, though at the back of the handout I've given you a little bit more on pages 545, 41, um, in the syllabus, of course, all that stuff. All right, otherwise I'd like to get away from that, moving into reporting financial performance and assets held for sale. Very, very important indeed. A little bit more down to earth than, say, agriculture. But all good stuff, all part of our massive syllabus. So where are we? Let's just go back, make sure we touch base occasionally. We've looked at Gale. I've set, in fact, we've done uh, Highwood, <coughs> page 165. I've set bricks and mortar for homework. We're now moving into Mallet and chamber, uh, a few marks on all of that sort of stuff. So, also plenty of home study there. Chapter 10 is called Reporting Financial Performance, and then chamber covers tax. So these are the two remaining issues for today. Reporting Financial Performance, I put in there IS 1 and 8, and then assets are for sale, a small little thing called IFRS 5. Um, reporting financial performance. Our paper, you remember, is called financial reporting. So all I'm doing is swapping those two words. So you can imagine the examiner looking at this area very closely, given the similarity of 
the chapter title, the topic title, to our exam paper title. As a cell for sale is a tiny little standard which is easy to follow. But as you look through the content space, there's a comprehensive example here called Forest. Really, really important question to do. It's a 35 marker. Basically, I picked up an old question called Tree and I added bits onto it and suddenly it became so big, it became like a forest. So I want you to try out that question and look at my answer, detailed answer at the back. And of, of course, if you have access to the videos on the platform, you'll see me solving that question called forest uh, available to you. Okay, so either look at my answer at the back or look at the recordings where you see me doing it step by step, the video recordings, but at the very least, uh, you know, spend some time reading the question and trying to understand that a 35 marker, obviously in the exam you only get 20 markers, but which part of the 35 will come up? Is it this bit or is it this bit? Very hard. So I thought I'd just do a big one. If the examiner goes for this bit, 20 marks, or this bit, 20 marks, or this bit, 20 marks, at least my 35 marker covers it. This is a hope. Okay, so that's page 187. All right. The best way of thinking of this topic is to imagine it as making some amendments to the kind of format we were looking at yesterday. Profit and loss account, etc. When a company discontinues an activity, it must show an analysis of the profits and losses in the component parts of, uh, that comprise the component parts that comprise continuing acquisitions and discontinued. Uh, by the way, this is your pages. 98, 99, etc. A discontinued operation is described as a component or an entity that either has been disposed of as or classified as held for sale. Okay. And represents a separated major line of business or geographical area, is a, is a part of a single coordinated plan to dispose of a separate, separate major line, or it could be a subsidiary acquired exclusively with a view to resale. Okay, so if you acquire a subsidiary intending to sell it, you mustn't consolidate it. You must, um, you know, put it, keep it to one side. So you just read through those notes. Also, what the examiner says about why discontinued is so useful. I don't understand you can read those notes out. You can do that yourself. I'd like to do some numbers though. So as you move along, there's something about presentation. And then you have the actual format. It's just like any old PNL, really, but it adds to the page 99 format. So this sort of bit here, it adds to the page 99 format, just in case it comes up. What we used for Interceptor yesterday. All right. And the other place to look is see also your page one eight page two page one eighty seven the question called forest question solution I show you how to lay it out. So this is simply like our usual layout except you have a uh, the word continuing going in at the top like that, at the top of the PL and lower down you have a bit more detail with regard to discontinued. In the exam, you don't get notes. You have to show it on the face like I show you in Forest. All right, please note that items such as ordinary dividends, accumulated profits, etc., from previous years are no longer shown in the statement of P&L, but they're shown somewhere else in something called a statement of changes in equity. I said to you, don't worry about saucy. I'll explain it later. That moment has arrived. There you are. Statement of changes in equity. How many times have we had this in the exam? 12, 13 times in recent years. It comes up virtually every time. I would say four out of five times on average. So we better make a big effort on it. Very, very simple idea. Statement of changes in equity. Regularly examined, as I say. So if I give you a chance to read it, read what it's about. Please, I'll keep quiet for a minute while you do that. Please. I can then show you what it looks like. 
This is the famous Saucy, repeatedly examined. Okay, so part of a big published exercise could be a scenario, I suppose. So Saucy, statement of changes in equity. You have your share capital, share premium, revaluation, retained earnings, anything like that in a total. So obviously you add left to right. And you have an opening balance. A special transfer, I'll tell you about that separately. Dividends, net profit, and then the closing. It's almost like saying, you see, uh, the P&L is a bit too much. If you produce a P&L and I'm not an accountant, I'm totally overwhelmed by all this information. We, so, we look just now at continuing, discontinued, all that kind of, it's too much for me. NCIs and PUPs and who knows what else. I'm totally overwhelmed by it. But what shareholders have been asking directors, you are the accounts producer, the financial reporting expert, what shareholders are saying to directors is please, can you keep away all this detail from me? Of course, I'd like it to be part of the published accounts, but can you just pull out of these huge this huge set of accounts, can you just pull out, say, about half a page, a third of a page of the information I really, really need? Like, what profit did the company make? What's my dividend for the year? Yes, if I give you some shares, where do the shares appear in the overall scheme of things, the equity? So it's a way of simplifying accounts for the non-specialist user. Remember, most accounts users are not qualified accountants and they are a little bit overwhelmed by the kind of detail we produce. So we've got to cut it down a bit. And so basically, you have an opening balance and a closing balance. And the closing balance is down here somewhere. All right, so that's your framework. Um, we then will look at a question, past exam question, to see if we can bring through some ideas. The question here is called Mallet. The following extracted balances relating to Mallet are given to you. The ordinary shares are 20 cents each. As you know, that means this is the share capital. And so I suppose there's 250,000 shares, but 50,000 50, is the share capital. Retained earnings at the start of the year, opening balance, opening balance. The redeemable preference shares, of course, will not be in the saucy, nor this, not in saucy. As you know, the redeemable preference shares are shown as non-current liabilities, liabilities. doesn't really say which part of 2015 is going to be repaid at. So it's hard to say whether it's a current or non-current. Let's say it's a liability. And the interim preference dividend, of course, must be shown as a finance cost in P&L. As liability, of course, goes to the SFP. So those two are trick points from the examiner. Those should not appear in a SOSI. SOSI is only to do with ordinary shares, equity. Then you have your ordinary dividend paid. And some other information, profit for the year before ordinary dividends was 57.2 and the special excess depreciation, which I'll explain shortly, is 500,000. Okay, so those two do not appear in the saucy. Okay, now I'd like to take you back and pop it into the framework here. With your help, we can knock this out. I'll take out the very special point, this 500, which apparently comes out of the revaluation reserve and is pushed into the retained earnings. I'll explain how and why in a minute. The opening balance from the, pre from the next page is 50,000. There's no share premium. The revaluation is given as 18.5. The retained is given as 47.8. And I'll do the total. 116.3 okay oops the profit for the year or by the way the ordinary dividend is two and a half so better take it away like this
The net profit for the year is 57.2. And so the closing balance, this is your profit after tax, PAT profit after tax, closing figures are 50,000, nothing, 18,000, 103, and this is 171. And rather like a consolidated PL, you add all this up, and that finally agrees. Okay, it's just a little piece of information for the shareholder who's totally overwhelmed by the detailed consolidated PL. Just makes life easier for them. The one item that I haven't explained is the transfer of depreciation on revaluation. So, what I'd like to do is to show you the detail of that idea on the next page. Here it is. Okay, so this excess depreciation. Can I ask you to read that right now, please? Then I'll explain it to you. You see, basically, when you revalue an asset upwards, you do a fair value adjustment like we do on consolidations and indeed on a single company. If you revalue an asset upwards, depreciation must be based on the revalued amount. But the lawyers, the Companies Act people, the Companies Act says that when, the, when you're working out the maximum that can be distributed as a dividend, depreciation must be based on cost, not the revalued amount. So because in the accounts you've charged depreciation based on the revalued amount, the higher figure, what you need to do is to add back to profit the depreciation on the revaluation surplus. So what we're doing is we're taking it out of the revaluation reserve and pushing it back into the PL. And that basically is why in the saucy it comes away from the revaluation reserve and is pushed back into retained earnings. So what you need to do at home is to just read through those little lines on the second page. This gives you a flavor of what all that's about. That comes up in the exam quite regularly for one mark, so it's often examined, as I say. Now, beyond that, we have lots and lots of bits and pieces for you to do for homework, reading, all of that. Very interesting, but very easy. Also, some MCQs from recent exams. Have a look at all those MCQs with answers supplied, of course. KB Construction in the homework, you'll see me setting that. Uh, and as you go along, a couple of pages along, there is a nice question coming up. Uh, IFRS 5, assets held for sale and discontinued operations, nothing much there for me to say. But with regard to discontinued operations, there's a nice question there called rebound, which I want to have a go at. Have a little read of it, please. And I'll show you how we might handle a question such as that. The examiner was saying earlier that um, using uh, separating continuing from discontinued is a very important um, thing for shareholders because it enables them to forecast the future. So here you have a question from this examiner in our F7 paper called Rebound. could easily be an MCQ, but it was a bigger question than two marks when it came up. So the PNL extracts, here we are. 2014-2013, continuing and discontinued, all separated. Profit after tax is made up of existing and operations acquired on that date. Now, the year we are dealing with is obviously 1st of April 2013 to the 31st of March 2014. That's our current year. So we acquired something on the 1st of August 2013, I reckon it's eight months to the year end. August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So only eight months of the current year has been brought in there because of course you acquired the new activities, the new operations, eight months into the new year. 
So what the examiner did was just give you this information and he says analysts, people who analyze accounts, expect profits from the market sector in which rebounds existing operations are based to increase by 6% in the coming year and by 8% in the newly acquired operations. So if you're doing anything like ratio analysis, it looks like the newly acquired operations were a good purchase, was a good activity to get into because in the coming year that's going to grow up grow by eight percent whereas our normal activity is only going to grow by six percent so we've got to calculate rebounds estimated profit after tax for the coming year okay so this is a forecast we don't do much forecasting in financial reporting but mainly we are backward looking but occasionally we look at forecasts here's an example now i think I can fit that in with your help into the little space that we have available. If you write small, we should be okay. So let's give this a shot, even though it's meant to be for homework. I'm going to do it in class. So 2014's figures are there. And then if I can say, how can I forecast it into 2015, as whenever this question came up. So the profit after tax is made up of existing which is also continuing described as and that's two thousand in thousand dollars and that's going to go up by six percent so I suppose I could multiply it by 1.06 and so the figure here is two one two zero and the existing also has some discontinued for the current year of 750. We made losses. And if you have 750 for the current year, what of the discontinued will happen next year? And the answer, of course, is nil. Because discontinued means it's discontinued. But the most interesting thing is the acquisition. I'll write in red, this is dangerous. For eight months, we had a figure of 450. But of course, because that's for eight months, what was it for a, what would it be for a whole year? So I'm going to multiply by 12 and divide by eight months. In other words, 50% more or 675. And this thing is going to go up by 8%. And so if you multiply that out, this comes to 729. And so the grand total is something like 2849. The examiner was saying something like 15% of candidates got that right, according to his markers. So it's, it's quite tricky, especially things like discontinued. So I thought I'd better do it in class gives you a flavor. So that's the forecasted figure. Okay. And don't forget that famous question called Forest that I was recommending earlier. Something for you to look at. So I leave you to put some time into picking that up. Otherwise, I'd like to move on to doing a little bit on tax. So if I flick past Forrest and a bit of an answer there, detailed answers at the back. Let's make a start on tax and deferred tax. This is your IS-12. This will be in the exam in some shape or form always. Okay, so page 193. Uh, moving from the known to the unknown, etc. Let me explain what I mean by that. Marching on. Always examined, as I say, has to be part of published, or if you don't get published, you get lots of uh, standards type questions, etc. So following on from following on from Interceptor, which we did the other day yesterday and forest which I hope you'll do for homework 
we have a couple of things here just to build on our knowledge and that is in the PL what happens to tax okay so this is your thousands millions whatever it might be now in the PL, if you remember from yesterday we have this thing called CUD in other words you start with your current year tax whatever that might be then you have your under stroke brackets over provision for previous years and under provision is always a debit in trial balance and over provision is always a credit in trial balance and then of course you have your deferred tax transfer we did a bit of deferred tax yesterday and so this figure you see goes to the PL. so you have about a 20-day gap before i see you next time catch up with all the reading from the class notes it's a very very big syllabus a bigger, I understand, from the ACCA than almost any other subject at whatever level. It's just a huge syllabus. It's not difficult, but if you don't put in the time, it will, it will become difficult. So be careful. SFP, as at whatever year end. Under this, we have, of course, deferred tax, which is shown as a non-current liability. And as we saw with Interceptor yesterday, the opening balance could be so much, the PL transfer could be this, and the difference, of course, is the closing, or the sum of the two is the closing. And so the difference from here just is shoved into there. Very, very straightforward exercise indeed. Okay. So in the exam, don't forget it is the difference between the opening and the closing that goes in to the PL. So that's exactly what we were doing yesterday in the question called Interceptor and what you will do over the next few days under Forest. Okay. Now, occasionally the question will say there's a revaluation of buildings. And if there's a revaluation, you always have to provide deferred tax on it because should the building be sold, let's say you have a building worth two million and you're going to sell it or it's revalued to three million. Okay, the extra one million, should the building be sold, becomes taxable. And so what deferred tax does is provides for that tax on the one million. Okay, so it's an additional kind of deferred tax, postponed tax. All right, beyond that, we have a few bits and pieces, income taxes, accounting profit, etc. Just what I've been saying to you. But I thought what I'd do is practice. ASA, of course, is once you've read the notes, a bit of homework. Chambers, a past exam question. That's the one I would like to do now. Have a quick read of it, please, and you and I will try to put together a quick answer in the time we have left. So it's a public company, has the following items, among many others, in its trial balance. Debit credit, tax, deferred tax at the start of the year. The following notes are relevant. The balance of tax represents the amount left after payment of tax for the previous year. Uh, not much help that statement, but if it's on the debit side, it's always an under provision. Because provisions generally are credits, so if you have an over provision, it's always a credit. Okay, so over provision is a credit in the trial balance. Just remember that. Provisions, over provisions are credits, therefore over, under provisions are debits. So you just charge it this year. The balance of tax represents the amount left after payment of tax for the previous year. That's good. 
The directors have estimated the provision of corporation tax for the current year as 22 million, and the opening deferred tax is to be adjusted to a credit balance of, 12, uh, of 14 million. That's the closing deferred tax. So, how does all this appear in the PL and the statement of financial position? That's, why I'm that's where I'm taking you. So let's do some of the stacks today and we can always finish it off next time. The next session is a bit quieter, so I've decided to finish stacks there and do some foreign currency before we do um, things like uh, we, when we revisit published accounts. Okay, so all that's in the, in the program, the study planner. So where are we? Let's see. Here we are. Example two, chamber, past exam question extract, page, whatever that is, 196. So how do we do this? We start with the PNL. For year ended, they don't really give us the year. And so you have your C, U, D. The C stands for current year tax, obviously 22,000. The U stands for under provision for the previous year. And that's 200. And then you have your deferred tax transfer, which at this point we don't know, but that becomes a PL charge, that thing. 23,000, whatever it might be, or maybe less. Then comes the SFP, Statement of Financial Positions, is exactly what we were doing yesterday. So we have the SFP as at, and this is your deferred tax, also known as a non-current, deferred, postponed, non-current liability. So you have your opening balance, which is always a figure in the trial balance, and that is set to be 17000 500. Leaving a couple of lines, this is your closing balance, and that's given as 14. And so the difference between the two is um, 3,500, and that's your PL transfer. Which PL transfer I need to pick up and push up here, you see? And that's three and a half thousand. That three and a half thousand, when you add it all up, is eighteen thousand seven hundred. And that's it. Very, very straightforward indeed. The deferred tax transfer. Don't forget if the seventeen and a half and the fourteen were swapped round, the three and a half will have no brackets round it. Okay, also in the SFP, you must show the current tax, current tax is shown under current liabilities. And that figure, of course, is 22,000. Remember, yesterday I was saying to you, you have the CUD mnemonic, but the only thing that comes through these don't go through is just this one, the current tax. And that's 22,000. And the reason is the under over has been sorted out in the PL, and the D, of course, deferred tax has got its own slot as non-current liabilities, which of course has shown up here. Okay, so plenty there for you to think about. 
I'd like you to read the rest of the chapter. There's a nice question called Atlas, as you can see there. Nice question called Atlas, if I take you back to your class notes. In the homework, I've asked you to do that. My answer on page 444 is there. And of course, beyond that, there are some more bits and pieces for you to look at. We'll see how the time goes when I see you next time in about 20 days time, 20 days closer to the exam, don't forget. When I might pick it up at about page 198. I'll make a note of that. It's a little bit longer spend on deferred tax and then we'll pick up whatever is left in our program. So we've done mallet, we've done chamber, but I intend to do a little bit more on deferred tax and obviously there's foreign currency now joining the syllabus and then beyond that there are some small items like Lama, altered, etc., to get done in one session. So we have a little bit of time, spare time built into our program. Otherwise, all I have to do is wish you all the best. I'd like you to take it up to about page 197, 198, somewhere around there. But if you roll back to the, the previous, which is nearly 200 pages, there's plenty of homework there for you to look at. So, as I say, the main reason why people struggle with this exam is they don't put in the work now and they suddenly realize the exam is upon them um, in a few weeks time and they haven't done enough work so can I just recommend that you push yourself hard in the early stages of this course because it is a very easy syllabus I mean that a very easy syllabus not too deep but certainly very wide so because you've got these MCQ 60 marks of MCQs any of these little peripheral areas like impairment tangibles tax etc intangibles could come up in MCQs and have come up repeatedly so it's not just the big numerical questions that matter I'm depending on you reading the class notes which I've written myself putting in some time as well thank you very much for your attention all the very best do send me any emails if I can help Thanks, Emmanuel, for listening.